Hey guys, welcome to the Frontline Community Church Podcast. My name is David Dorner, and I am the teaching pastor here at Frontline in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and it is so good to be with you. Our mission in this world is to see zero people unchanged by Jesus. So whether you've been following Jesus for a lifetime or if your journey's just begun, we hope that this message will speak powerfully to your heart, that it will reveal something that God desires to cultivate in your life, and that you'll be drawn to the person of Jesus as a result. We hope these next few moments encourage you, challenge you, and inspire you to be who God has created you to be. We hope you enjoy it. Morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Great to be back with you in person. If you're watching online, it's great to have you with us as well. And uh, congratulations to all you Michigan fans. Man. Feels like Christmas came a little bit early for all of you uh, somehow. Um, So I'm excited because today we're starting, as Blake just mentioned, uh, week number one of this new series. We're we're talking about Christmas scandals. What we're talking about is um, maybe some of the more scandalous parts of Jesus' story and what that has to do with our world and us today. Uh, I love going to see movies in the movie theater. It's one of my favorite things. In fact, it's, that's one of the weird things over the last 20 months that feels like it's been missing. Uh, the last movie I actually saw in the movie theater was this movie, Dune. How many of you actually saw this in the movie theater? Some of you, like three of you. Okay, awesome. Um, so this movie was absolutely incredible. Um, now, I did not see the 1984 version, so I actually walked into the theater not knowing anything about Uh, this movie and what it was about. I actually, believe it or not, went to see it with a group of other pastors who were my friends. So we were all in the movie theater watching this together. What amazed me about this movie was how in the first just few minutes of the movie, the way that the writers took you straight into the action of the movie. Like there was just no waiting. Immediately, you're just pulled right in to the action of the movie. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to entice you to be able to want to watch the rest of the movie. Right? That's what great epic movies do. Uh, Within the first few minutes, you know, watching this movie, there's these two people groups, and there's this tension between them over this natural resource that's being fought over in the universe, and there's this mysterious main character, but you don't quite know his identity yet or or what role he's going to play in it. It's just incredible how quickly they get you into that. Just in the first few minutes, you know all of that. Movie trailers do this too, right? Right? Movie trailers now usually are about two to three minutes long, and they're all about just putting you straight into the action, making you go, man, I want to see the rest of that. They entice you to want to see the rest of the movie. And so the reason I tell you that is because if you think about the gospel story, one way you can think about the gospel story is that it is the greatest story that's ever been told. And I really truly believe that. I believe the gospel, the story of Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection, that is the greatest story that's ever been told. Now, I I would say it's actually even more than just the greatest story ever told. I think it's the greatest truth that we could ever embrace or accept in our lives. But if you think about it in those kind of terms, it's the greatest, most epic story ever been told. If I were to ask you, if you were tasked with telling the greatest story that's ever been told, how would you begin? What would your first few minutes be like? How would you take your listeners straight into the action of the story? How would you do that? What we're going to do in this series is we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew's gospel, and today we're going to start out right in Matthew 1 verse 1, and we're going to look at how Matthew, when he was tasked with writing the greatest story ever told, how he got his listeners, how he got us into the story of Jesus. Here we go. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Are you ready? Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amenadab, Amenadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abiah, Abiah the father of Asa, Asa the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Jehoram, Jehoram the father of Uzziah, Uzziah the father of Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz, Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Ammon, Ammon the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. (gasps) 
after the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abihud, Abihud the father of Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, Achim the father of Elihud, Elihud the father of Eleazar, Eleazar the father of Matan, Matan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus who is called the Messiah. <gasps> oh, I should have stretched before doing that, man. I think I might have pulled something. I don't know about you, but my heart is just pounding right now with that intro. <laughs> Not exactly, right? It's sort of, it's sort of anticlimactic, isn't it? I mean, why in the world w- would Matthew begin this way? He's starting the greatest story ever told. And so the, the question I want to ask is, why would Matthew start the greatest story ever told with a boring genealogy? Why would you do that? Why would you start that way if you wanted to get your listeners into the story? Here's what I want you to understand. To a first century audience, this was an epic movie beginning. To a first century audience, this was this action-packed, power-packed, epic beginning to the story. Here's what we know. Matthew wrote his gospel from the city of Antioch. Now, if you know uh, the book of Acts, if you're unfamiliar with it, when the early church began to spread, there were two main hubs, Jerusalem, and then in the north, Antioch. Now, what we know about Antioch is Antioch was the first place where there were both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, non-Jewish people. So Matthew is writing his gospel to both Jewish people and Gentile people, trying to tell them the greatest story that's ever been told. Now, the Jewish people, they had questions about the, the Jewish Messiah, They had questions about who he was and what he was supposed to be doing. And they had questions actually as to whether or not Jesus actually was the Jewish Messiah, whether or not he actually fit that bill. The Gentile people had even more questions. Uh, Even if he is the Jewish Messiah, even if he does fit that bill, well, then he's here for them. He's not here for me. He's not here for us. What does that got to do with me? And so... Uh, Matthew is con- specifically constructing this genealogy to speak to gr- both groups of people. Now, what you need to know is in the ancient world, genealogies were a big deal. People could trace their family lineage all the way back, especially Jewish people. It, it was a major way that you proved your identity, your heritage, your rights as a person. Uh, in fact, I was thinking about like, there's really only one thing like that in our world today that we still have. And it's like, you know, when you go to a doctor for the first time and the doctor sits down with you and wants to take a family medical history. Have you ever been through that whole process? So the doctor sits down with you and you got to talk about, okay, my mom has this, you know, my dad has that, this disease runs in our family. And, and the reason the doctor wants to take this family medical history is because uh, that family medical history says something about who you are and what your future is going to be like, or at least medically, physically, right? In the same way, that's kind of what a genealogy did in the ancient world. It established heritage and rights and a future of what a person was going to be. That's how they understood it. And so uh, Matthew, what he's doing here in this genealogy is he's purposely constructing this genealogy and he's including certain people on purpose and he's leaving other people out of Jesus' genealogy on purpose. In other words, what he's doing is he's dropping these little hints. He's trying to give us a little hints of here's who Jesus actually is. And he does it very intentionally and very specifically. So the question then is, what does Matthew's genealogy say about Jesus' family history? What does it say about who Jesus is? Because he's dropping these hints so that we know who Jesus is. And when you see it, when you understand It brings an unbelievable level of clarity to who Jesus is, and I would just say it brings a level of comfort, too, to what he wants to be in our lives. So here we go. What what Matthew does is he traces Jesus' genealogy primarily primarily through two people. We saw it right in the beginning of that first verse. Uh, It's through David and then through Abraham. Now, what do we know about David? What we know is that David, and actually in the genealogy there, it calls him King David. David was a king. Now, he wasn't just any king. David was probably the greatest, most epic, most prolific king in all of Israel's history. 
And it's important that he's in this genealogy because in Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet says that when the Messiah comes, he will reign on David's throne. In other words, the Messiah was to be a descendant of King David. So that's what we need to know about Jesus. That's what Matthew wants to know. First and foremost, he wants us to know that Jesus is a king. That's what Jesus is. He's coming into this world as a king. Now, the way that you interact with a king, the way that you relate to a king is different than the way that you relate to a counselor or a friend or a teammate, right? Those are the, you relate to those people very differently than you would relate to a king. A king has a kingdom. And in that kingdom, the king has authority. He has dominion. He has power. Uh, and, and so a king, when a king comes, a king is able to establish his kingdom and make things the way he wants them to be in his kingdom. A major focus of Jesus, and something that he talked about constantly over and over and over again in the Gospels, was the kingdom of God. Now, what's interesting is I would tell you every single human being wants the kingdom of God. If you're a Christian, you want the kingdom of God. If you are an atheist, you want the kingdom of God. Because when you actually read about what the kingdom of God is, it's the stuff that every human heart longs for. In fact, it's, it's the stuff that we actually talk about this time of year. We want the kingdom of God. We want peace on earth. We want goodwill toward men. We want a world in which there's no racism, no sex trafficking, no abuse, a world where no one is marginalized and everyone is treated equal. We want that. Every human being wants that, that kingdom of God. But we also want the right to choose for ourselves what's right or wrong morally for us. We don't want anybody imposing their views on us. We want to maintain our uh, autonomy, our independence, and our right to choose on issues that relate to us personally. As other Christian writers have said it, we want the kingdom, we just don't want a king. We don't want a king. And, and what Matthew's trying to tell us right away, he's a, he's a son of David, he's a king. Jesus is a king. You have to accept him on his terms, not on yours. And in other words, when Jesus comes, he has authority. He's to be revered and awed. And to accept Jesus is to submit to his lordship, his kingship over your life. That's what it is. Because he's a king. He's not your buddy. He's not your pal. He's not your teammate. He's a king. That's the first thing David, or I mean Matthew wants us to know. He's a son of David. He's a king. Now, stay with me. If that chafes a little bit, uh, For the Gentile audience listening to this, it would have chafed against them a little bit too because they would have said, look, you know, a Jewish king is not really what I was in the mood for. That's not what I was looking for. I wasn't looking to submit to some Jewish king. That's not what I want. And so Matthew tells us he's not only a son of David, he's also a son of Abraham. Now, why does that matter? It matters because in the book of Genesis, when God calls Abraham, he says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you can what? Be a blessing. He invites him. He says, I'm going to bless all peoples through you, Abraham. And so what Matthew wants us to know is that not only is he a son of David, he's also a son of Abraham, which means he's here for everyone. He's here to bless all peoples. That Jesus coming is going to be comfort. It's going to be uh, a welcome. It's going to be uh, a blessing for every single human being on this earth. All people. Even if you didn't get your tie perfectly straightened, even if you don't have the right pedigree, even if you didn't, you know, do all the right things, check all the right moral checklists, he's here for all people. And then, as if to prove his point that he is here for all people, Matthew does something that was absolutely unheard of in the ancient world when it came to genealogies. What he does is he includes five women in Jesus' genealogy. Here are their names right here. Tamar, Bathsheba, Ruth, Rahab, and Mary. Now let's talk about this just for a moment. In the ancient world, you never included women in a genealogy. Now, There was a reason for that. 
They didn't have science the way we do. They didn't understand, you know, the 50% of a person's DNA comes from the father. 50% of a person's DNA comes from their mother. They didn't understand it that way. They observed that a woman became pregnant when she'd been with a man. And so in their mind, the life of a person must come from the man. That's how they understood that. And so in a genealogy, you would never list women in there. You would only list the men because the life of a person was considered to come from a man. But what Matthew does is he includes women in the genealogy. He's saying, look, Jesus came. He's purposely doing this to say he didn't just come for men. He came for women too. He came for all people. He, re- he came to redeem all mankind, male, female, everybody. But then you look at this list of women that he includes in the genealogy. Now, again, I want you to get this. Matthew purposely chose and picked certain people and left out other people. Think about who he could have put in here. He could have put it Eve in Jesus' genealogy, right? Eve, that's a pretty, that's one of the greatest hits, right? I mean, she's a mother of all creation. You know, the helpmate for Adam. He was incomplete until he had her. That would be a good one to include. He could have included Rebecca or, or Rachel. Rachel was in Jesus' genealogy. He doesn't include Rachel. Rachel was one of the most beautiful, most desired women in the story of the Old Testament. It says that Jacob worked for seven years in order to have Rachel as his wife, but it says it seemed like it it was no time at all had passed because he was so in love with her. Rachel was desired. She was beautiful. She was loved. She was sought after. He doesn't include Rachel in the genealogy. You know who he includes? He includes the women in Jesus' genealogy Or if you were a Jewish person, you would have heard their names and kind of gone, ooh, yeah, I'm a little uncomfortable all of a sudden. Every one of these women's names carries with it a story of scandal, a story of disrepute, a story that that frankly would have had like, their names would have had like an asterisk beside it uh, because every single uh, Jewish person would have recognized these aren't just any women. These are the women in the story that you, you kind of you kind of remember their story for the, the difficult, scandalous things that happened. And Matthew is trying to say, Jesus came for them. Jesus came for the broken. For, for those who don't have it together. For those who don't have the perfect backstory. Tamar and Bathsheba, they were powerless. They were actually victims of sexual exploitation by powerful men. Ruth and Rahab were outsiders to the Jewish faith. They were literally foreigners who, because of circumstances, had to actually leave their people and their home, and they had no status, no rights, no, uh, no real personhood or identity of their own, and they had to be grafted in and join God's chosen people. They were outsiders. They were Gentiles. And Mary, I mean, Mary was a pregnant teenager whose fiancé almost left her when he found out that she was pregnant. That's who Matthew includes in the story. And what we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to look at their stories. We're going to look at their scandal stories, not just because of who they are, but because each one of their stories points to Jesus. We're going to look at how their story, their their, uh, struggle actually pointed to Jesus, the Messiah, and what he came to do and who he is in our world today. So that's what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks. So if I could sum up, here's what the genealogy is trying to say to us. Here's what Matthew, if I could sum it up in one kind of sentence, here's what he was trying to tell us. With Jesus' genealogy, Matthew's trying to say that in the family of God, everyone is welcome because Jesus was God's great invitation. In the family of God, everyone is now welcomed in because Jesus, when he came, was the invitation from God you can be a part of my family. All people. You can be a part of my family. My kingdom. You can be a part of that because Jesus was the invitation from God to do that. I love the way St. Augustine put it. It's one of the early church fathers in the, in the 300s. He said, there is no such thing as a saint without a past or a sinner without a future. There's no such thing as a, as a saint who doesn't have a past It wasn't redeemed by Jesus. And there's no such thing as a sinner right now without a future because Jesus was God's invitation into the family of God. Now, 
There's one more verse to the, to the pericope, to the passage that I just read. I just read you the first 16 verses of the genealogy. There's one more verse, I, and I can't, I can't leave it on the table because it's so amazing. Here it is. This is verse 17 of the genealogy. This is how the section ends. Matthew says, thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to, the ba- to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Now some of you in this room actually like math. And some of you are sitting there going, wait, that can't be possible. He says there are three three, uh, sets of 14, and then Jesus was born. Now, if you know anything about math, it doesn't take you that long. Even if you just read through the Bible and kind of scan it, you can figure out there was way more than 14. (laughs) What is Matthew saying? Matthew isn't trying to tell us there were exactly 14, exactly 14, exactly 14. He's trying to tell us something. He's including a certain uh, 14 and a certain 14 and a certain 14. He's structuring it and organizing it in such a way that he's trying to drop a hint to us about who Jesus is here. He's trying to tell us something about Jesus' identity. What's he trying to say? If you think about it, there are three sets of 14, three groups of 14. Another way you can think about that is there were six groups of seven. In other words, there were six sevens, and then Jesus was born as the seventh seven. Now, why is that significant? Because in Jewish thought, seven was the number of completeness. It was God's number. All the gospel writers, uh, they, they looked for significance in numbers. All throughout the gospels, you see this. What Matthew is saying right here is he's saying there were six sevens, and then when Jesus came, Jesus was the seventh seven. Seven is the number of completion. It's the number of wholeness. There were six days of creation and then God rested on the seventh and that completed the seven days of creation. In the Mosaic law, there was uh, six years of harvest cycle and then in the seventh year, you had to let the the land lie fallow because it belonged to God. And that completed the seven years of a harvest season. After seven cycles of seven years of harvest, uh, you would have 49 years, and then on the 50th year would be the year of Jubilee, the fulfillment of the seven sets of seven. And on and the year of Jubilee, the 50th year, all the slaves would be set free. All the family land that had been taken it would go back to the original owners, and all the debts would be canceled. Matthew is saying, when Jesus came, he was the seventh seven it was Jesus was God's way of saying, it is finished, done, redeemed, paid in full. Everything led up to this moment. The Mosaic law, the temple, the priesthood, the patriarchy, it all pointed to him. Jesus was the missing piece of the redemption story. And when he came, it was finished, whole, complete. And what I would tell you is Jesus is the missing piece in our world today. Matthew's words ring through the centuries to us today. For some of you in this room, for some of you watching online right now, Jesus is the missing piece of your life. And you've tried other things, You've moved into just about everything you can and you can't figure out why nothing satisfies us because Jesus is the missing piece of your life and Jesus was God's invitation for all people. No matter what your pedigree, no matter what your background, no matter what your story of brokenness, you can be welcomed into the family of God. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's what we celebrate about who Jesus is. You guys go to that last picture there. Um, this picture is from our Christmas services in 2019. That wasn't even two years ago. It feels like that was 10 years ago to me. <laughs> to anybody else after all we've been through over the last 20 months or so? Um, so to explain what you're seeing here, what you're looking at, what we did this particular year is we put a giant door uh, right in the middle of the room here, right where the cameras are, are sitting. We had this giant door. And for our Christmas services, what we did is we talked about John 10 where Jesus says, I am the door. In other words, you walk through me if you want to be reconnected through the Father. I came as the door. I came as the way. Like Jesus himself is the way when we embrace him as our, as our Lord, as our Savior, as our King, that he is the door. 
to salvation. He is the door to knowing the Father. And so what we did is we put this giant door and we, and we invited people to put their faith and their trust in Jesus. And then we said, if you're doing that, if you're putting your faith and trust in Jesus, we invited people to get up and walk through the door in the middle of the room. Some of you were here. It was an incredible uh, time of just celebration. One of my favorite stories that came out of uh, this, we had tons of people walk through the door uh, over the course of like a few services. Um, one of my favorite stories was there was a woman who came to one of the services because she was invited by her family. So she shows up with her family, had never come to our church before. And six months before this, she had undergone emergency open heart surgery. So uh, they'd had to, you know, open her up and, and fix her heart in order to save her life. And what her family didn't know was that when they put her under the anesthesia to go in for the surgery, she has a dream about a door. And she wakes up from this surgery. She's lived through this surgery, but she remembers this door in her dream. She has this very vivid dream about a door. She walks into this room for that Christmas service with her family and she sees this door standing in the middle of the room and she turns to her family and she says, I'm supposed to walk through that door. She didn't even hear the sermon yet. She didn't even know what this was. She didn't know why there was a door in the middle of the room, but she knew I'm supposed to walk through that door. And so when we got to that point in the service where we invited people to put their faith and trust in Jesus, nobody had to tell her what to do because the Holy Spirit had already been working, had already been pursuing, had already been speaking to her. Jesus was the missing piece. Listen to me. Some of you, it's neighbors, it's coworkers, it's family members who you come in contact with every day. They don't know why, but there's something missing in their lives. And I'm telling you, God is speaking to them. The Holy Spirit loves, because he loves us so much, he's pursuing them. He's speaking to them. They're having conversations and interactions that they can't make sense of. They're having dreams about a door and they don't know what it is. They're, crazy stuff is happening. And so we get to be that invitation. So what Blake was talking about earlier, those cards that are on your seats, like this is a holy thing. This is not just some like, you know, marketing thing, some propaganda. We're serious. The invitation that you might give, the, the, the person who you put that card in their hand might be somebody that comes at a Christmas service and surrenders their life to Jesus because God is already at work. We, we don't do it. We don't save people. We don't have that power. Jesus was the seventh seventh because he does it. It was complete in him. It was finished in him. And he is the missing piece of our world. He is the greatest need of our lives. For some of you today, that's what you need to do is you need to put your faith and your trust in him. And so uh, the last question here is just, who will you welcome into the family of God this Christmas? Everyone is welcome into the family of God because Jesus was God's invitation into his family. What are you gonna do with that? Who are you gonna take that invitation to? Would you bow your heads with me? I know we're out of time, but I don't wanna rush this moment. So Jesus, right now, God, I just, uh, I pray in this space that for all of us who actually already know you, would you remind us, God, of what it felt like to be lost, of what it felt like to not have that missing piece in you, of what it felt like to not belong to your family? Would you remind us of what that felt like? And for every one of us, Jesus, we worship you. We thank you that you are the king, that you came as the fulfillment, the one it all pointed to, the one who it is ultimately fulfilled in, and we are redeemed because of you. So for every one of us, God, would you lay on our hearts right now, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just lay on each one of our hearts a name, a person, a life, who you are the missing piece for and they don't even know it. God, right now, we just lift them up to you. We lift up those names to you. We bring them before you, the Father, who loves them more than we could possibly ever love anyone or love ourselves. 
We just ask that you would use us to be the invitation you've called us to be this season. Um, God, just show us how to do it. Show us how to open our mouths and speak. Show us how to invite. Show us how to pray. Show us how to just be in the life of someone who needs you. And then Jesus, I just pray for anyone who's hearing the sound of my voice right now. And maybe they have, there's some things they haven't been able to make sense of. God, would you reveal yourself to them as only you can, that the, you, you, you would truly reveal yourself as the missing piece of their life. And right now, God, I pray that, uh, God, if there's anyone hearing the sound of my voice who doesn't know you, that they would put their faith and their trust in you. It's as simple as just saying yes to the invitation. Jesus, you are Lord of my life. I believe that you came. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave for new life. So we just invite you into that space, God. And this Christmas, as we move forward, we thank you that you came as a son of David, as a son of Abraham, for all people, all people. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen.